Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Auz billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. On behalf of the Islamic City and Dr. Usnan Walji, I welcome you all to this important series of 10 programs on the 10 nights of Ashura. It is usually a practice among the Shia sect of the Muslim community to host these programs all over the world in different towns and different cities, different localities, reliving and retelling this story of Imam Hussein and his great sacrifice and martyrdom. And it looks strange because Imam Hussein does not represent one sect of Islam or one group and one faction of Islam. He represents Islam. He represents the spirit of Islam. And he represents the basic ethos and basic values of Islam. And it is in that kind of framework that the Islamic city decided to host the program on the first 10 nights of Muharram to remind ourselves of the great sacrifice and great martyrdom. But we intend to do it in a manner that basically would take us back to the basic framework of the message of Imam Hussein. And the message revolves around one simple principle. And that principle is that the life is sacred. But there come moment in a human's life when the goal of life becomes more important than the life itself. Throughout the human history. Human beings have demonstrated that the spirit of Imam Hussein in different phases, in different times, in different situations. Yet there have not been many who followed Imam Hussein in his footsteps, in his standing up for those people whom we call the persecuted people, whom we call the oppressed people whom we call the marginalized people all over the world, regardless of their faith and regardless of their ethnicity and regardless of their culture. Today with Dr. Hasnan Walji, we definitely would want to embark on that journey to understand who those persecuted people of the world are. And then we would tackle issues related to the Dalits of India, related to the Native Americans in the United States, related to the enslavement of Africa, about the Jewish enslavement. We will talk about the Uyghurs of uh, China. We will talk about the Palestinian uh, displacement. We will talk about uh, Myanmar. We will also talk about Muslims of India who are on the verge of facing a genocide and we would talk about the plight of the migrant laborers in different parts of the world. In these 10 days, the one with whom we started this journey, one of the dearest friend and one of the friends of the Islamic city, a visionary, a practical and pragmatic leader who has devoted himself to increase the interfaith and intercommunity understanding to make this world a better place for his seven grandchildren and many more. Dr. Stan Walji is an educator, he's a historian, he's a filmmaker, and he's an author who has 
written over 20 books on nutrition and natural medicine. His lifelong quest is to envision ways and means to enable civil society to confront new realities of the modern era. He was born in Tanzania. He's of Indian ancestry, uh, but he got education in the United Kingdom in his institutional work promoting social justice. And for almost four decades in four continents, he has been involved in issues pertaining to social justice. He serves as the executive director of the United Global, Global Initiative an international NGO with focus on women empowerment and children's health. He has continued contribution from his active engagement on many boards ranging from the World Federation of Hoja, who we once presided, Universal Muslim Association of America, National Muslim Catholic Dialogue, and I seek, and that demonstrates the breadth of his socio-political endeavor in tackling social injustices that confront our civil society. We are honored to have him. He is in New York giving lectures to his community, broadcast every day. And immediately after his presentation on these issues, he joins us from his hotel room where he's temporarily lodging. We are honored to have him and we welcome him for this particular series. Once Dr. Asnan Walji makes his opening remarks, then I'll intervene and basically focus on what we are going to discuss today. But needless to say that we must congratulate Islamic City Brother Aleem, who is the director, Brother Muni, Brother Amir, Brother Aji, and many others who are part of the Islamic city for taking this initiative and showing it to the Muslim community and the world that it is possible that the Shias and Sunnis can come together to stand shoulder with shoulder on issues of justice, on issues of compassion and kindness, and saying loudly and clearly that the Imam represents Islam, not just faction, one faction of Islam. And then we all acknowledge the great sacrifice and great martyrdom that he offered to save the soul of Islam. Welcome, Dr. Hasnain Walshi. Jazakallah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Aslam for those uh, very kind words. And I'd like to first uh, appreciate Islamic City, yourself and Brother Aleem uh, for giving this opportunity so that we are able to together uh, evaluate, learn, reflect, introspect on the meaning of Muharram, which should be the meaning of Muharram, not just to Shias, not just to Sunnis, but to the entire planet because these values that we commemorate are indeed uh, universal values. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, it gives me uh, you know, great pleasure to be again on this panel at Islamic City. And Dr. Aslam, kudos to you. You continuously try to ensure that the Shia and the Sunnis come together on a platform so that we can look at common issues and enhance understanding. Uh, and Islamic City is doing a, a great job. In terms of the subject, I think you very adequately and very aptly uh, described the focus. And inshallah, in the days to come, we will learn so much more from those marginalized communities, those oppressed communities around the world uh, who could benefit and will benefit uh, and take solace from the example of the grandson of the Blessed Prophet, Imam Hussein, when he stood in Karbala against so many enemies. And as all his soldiers, all his companions lay dead 
on the scorching plains of Karbala. It is recorded that he stood up and he said these words, Hal min nasir Indian surna. Is there a helper who will help me? What begs the question is that all those who could have helped him have now given their lives. And there's also an added report that he turned in four different directions and said the same words. Is there a helper who will help me? So who was he calling out to? And this really is a crux of the discussion of social justice that he was calling out to each one of us. He was in fact calling out to the entire humanity and say that wherever there is somebody who is oppressed, wherever there is somebody whose rights have been taken away, help them because I'm asking that help from you to help those people. And indeed, this is our duty. Having said that, Islam is a global faith. It's a global religion. And we need to demonstrate to the whole world that its teachings are also in harmony with other faiths. And I can see no better example than Karbala, which has the potential of inspiring people towards goodness and ethical conduct, towards social justice, to ensure that everybody leads a peaceful and harmonious life. During these 10 days, particularly within the Shia community, there are many, many rituals, and there are many gatherings, there are many activities, and much effort is being put in order to reenact, remember the tragedy of Karbala. I say with the greatest humility that mere indulgence in rituals, however fervently, cannot really answer, do justice to the call of Halmin Nasir Indian Surna, is there a helper who will help me? by the grandson of the Blessed Prophet, Imam Hussein, if we ignore the call of our conscience towards social justice. And this is our discussion. This is where, inshallah, we will meet representatives from the oppressed minorities and the oppressed people to actually share their pain, to let us know what is going on so that we are better informed. And once we are better informed, then there's, maybe there is something that we can do. There is a Quranic precedence to this. That when the moral fabric of a society is being torn, then such a community traverses the path of corruption and needs to be reformed. We know, we learn in Surah al Hud, ayah number 88, and Dr. Asram can better speak to this, being a scholar of the Quran, that Hazrat Shoeb was quoted as saying, I desire nothing but reform so far as I'm able. And with none but Allah is the direction of my affair to uh, the right issue. And on him do I rely and to whom, to him do I turn. It is within this spirit of reform of Islam that we need to understand the tragedy of Karbala, the actions of Imam Hussein at that time that these are to be reenacted once again, this Muharram and every Muharram. Indeed, in his own words, Imam Hussein declares his mission of reformation as he's leaving Medina, the city you know, of the Blessed Prophet. And it's sad when you uh, read the accounts of him leaving Medina, you know, a place where he had grown up, a place where he had played you know, in the arms of the Blessed Prophet. And he says that that indeed I'm leaving Medina to reform the ummah of my grandfather. This idea of Islam indeed goes back to the very first call that was made by the Blessed Prophet. When he declared in Makkah to say, Kulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu. Say la ilaha illallah so that you may be delivered so that you may be free, which gave people the courage to stand up and speak truth to power as Hatta Bilal did. 
So the above words that I'm leaving Medina for the Islah of the Ummah of my grandfather, in fact, eloquently capture the mission of Imam Hussein, the reform of the Ummah through Amr bin Maruf, through Nayan in Munkar, to enjoin in the good and to forbid from the evil. So to seek reform in Islam indeed is a duty for each one of us. And it's through Amr bin Maruf, it is through Nayan in Munkar that we can raise the human conscious in our quest for social justice. I will end on this note, that every one of our actions during these months, during these 10 days and beyond, should be for all of us, be towards a rededication to the message of Imam Hussein and his message of reformation, because that is what Islam is all about. And in order to do that, we cannot remain indifferent towards the personal and the social disorders and injustices around us if we are truly to pay homage to Imam Hussein. As I said before, however fervently we may do our rituals and commemorative assemblies, by, and if we do not imbibe the social justice message in, the, in, 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 in its practical form, then we shortchange ourselves. If we lock them away for another year and continue during the interim, ignoring the call of our conscience to heed the message of Karbala, then we have truly shortchanged ourselves. The movement of Hussein, the movement of Imam Hussein is a reforming movement based on the Islamic principles. Nay, I say on the human principles of justice and equity. And his uprising was aimed at the corruption of the rulers of the day. And this is what, what it is today. As we will discuss in the days to come, that today we have many parallels. And as we commemorate yet another Muharram, we cannot shirk our responsibilities to campaign against injustice, oppression, poverty, corrupt, corruption, and other social disorders. I will stop here and allow Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And as you rightly pointed out, during the next 10 days, we would primarily focus on two issues. We know that out of the 7 billion people, nearly 85% of the world population can claim to live in conditions that can be defined as oppressive. But there have been communities, historically as well as uh, contemporarily, who have suffered more than average human beings. And one of the questions that we would like to explore is that how come during the last 1400 years, ever since after the emergence of Islam and ever since after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, how come that the Muslim community forgot that lesson of justice and forgot that lesson of standing up for the oppressed and the marginalized people of the world, regardless of their faith and regardless of their culture? Why did we allow slavery to basically become rampant in the world? Why did we let the Native Indian and Native American suffer? Why did we let Dalit suffer? Why did we leave let the Palestinian? These are the questions that we would explore and see how we can learn from the history and then take the footsteps of Imam Hussein in fulfilling our responsibilities. Our struggle is not to fight against each other. Our struggle, as was the struggle of Imam Hussein, to, was to fight against all those who are oppressors, against all those who use and exploit all those things. So these are the issues that we would definitely be exploring. But one of the issues that we would discuss it today is uh, what is oppression? And Dr. Balji, of course, would give his perspective also. But let me summarize what I understand so that we can build the discussion around that. 
There are five major components that the word exponents and experts on justice and on oppression and wrongdoing on unfairness have identified, which they say indicate that the oppression is taking place. The first is exploitation. When a group of people, elites, or the power holders exploit the conditions and the power that they have to subdue other people. So that is the first ingredient of uh, oppression. The second is when the, it renders people powerless, that even though they have been experiencing all those kind of injustices and wrongdoings, they are powerless to do anything on their own. The third is marginalization. That these communities, these individual fields marginalized of no value, of no interest, even though God has given them dignity and God has given them the freedom and the God has given them the, the, the respect. The third, fourth is the cultural domination, that a group of people tries to dominate other through its ideas, through its vision, through its own way of thinking. And the finally is when violence is invoked against those powerless, marginalized and exploited people. Now, if you look at it, the sac great sacrifice that was offered by Imam Hussain, you find that all these five components were present in his call to defy the powers that be and to challenge the authorities, even though those authorities claim themselves to be Muslims. And this was, and many of those people who were basically on the side of wrong were the ones who were basically pointing fingers at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and also at the grandsons of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for that extent. And there were those who, who remained silent for whatever reason. And this is something that we need to understand that the Imam Hussein's struggle was against exploitation, against those who want to subdue the powerless people, against marginalization, against imperial, cultural imperialism or what we call cultural domination, and against violence. And it is in this particular context, I can definitely offer one of the verses of the Quran and at least three narrations that are related to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by both the Sunni and Shia sources. The Quran, for instance, says in chapter 14, verse 42, and think not that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is unaware of what the oppressors do. He only grants them respite until the day the eyes will stare in horror. What basically is being said here is that the oppressors must not think that they would last forever. A day will come when the Karbala will take place. A day will come when the impact of Karbala will reach in far corners of the world to shackle and to shake their authority and their authoritarianism. In this kind of same when Quran also says in chapter three, verse 140, Allah does not love the oppressors. So if Allah does not love the oppressors, then who we as Muslims are to say any word in praise of oppressors or with those who sided with the oppressors, which goes against the Quran which goes against the fundamentals of our faith. And then let's come to the sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that one of the, which is in both the traditions, that Allah says that, oh, my slaves, I have forbidden zulm, that is oppression, injustice, wrongdoing, unfairness. To myself, I have made it illegitimate, haram, forbidden amongst you. So do not do wrong to one another. So anyone who does wrong 
no matter who that person is, in fact, is violating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is challenging the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the other hadith, uh, it is also said that beware of the supplication of the oppressed, for there is no barrier between it and Allah. And certainly, if you look at the history, who had known that the decimation of the family of Imam Hussein would create one of the greatest movement of justice all over the world in the history of humanity. Millions, millions assemble in Karbala to pay tribute to Imam Hussein, to live that kind of thing. And nobody even remembers the name of those people who sided with the oppressors and who sided with those who basically challenged the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third one is another saying of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says that be aware of injustice, for injustice will be darkness on the day of resurrection. Be aware of obscenity, for Allah does not love obscenity and immorality. Beware of greed, for it tempted those before you and caused them to make lawful what is unlawful and to shed blood and severe their family dies. So our tradition is rich in terms of standing up against injustice. And our Prophet ﷺ, what he said as far as injustice is concerned, as far as oppression is concerned, is both acknowledged by the Shias and the Sunnis. The issue is that how should we combine our strength together to stand up, not only the marginalized people of the Muslim community, not only those who have been living on the periphery of the community, but to help and support those people who have suffered under different names, even at the hands of Muslims, or even at the hands of those people who claim to be the followers of God immensely throughout history. And that is the task that every Muharram should remind us. And that is what we intend to do. Because when the speakers would be talking about the Dalits or the Uyghurs or the Africans or the Palestinians or the Muslims and the Myanmar people or the immigrant workers or the native Indians, we would be asking them in what way Muslims could become part of the larger struggle for truth and for justice and against oppression. Because that is what our destiny is. And that is what we basically be questioned on the day of judgment. That how did we spend our human and material resources in fighting against those who are violating the fundamental principles that God has created this universe with. And God has bestowed dignity, justice, and freedom to all human beings. I'll stop here. And I will ask Dr. Hastan Wazji that how does he view the, the, the oppression? How would he define it? And uh, what does he think of that uh, framework that I mentioned in, includes five components, exploitation, powerlessness, marginalization, cultural or domination or imperialism and violence. And he would like to add anything to that. Uh, please, um, uh, elaborate on that one, Dr. Walchi. Thank you uh, for that elucidation and, and the clarity of thought is appreciated. And truly, uh, the five points that you raised, uh, perhaps the answer lies in the, the uh, ayah of Surah Al Maida, I think it's ayah number two. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa ta'awanu ala al-birri wa taqwa wa la ta'awanu ala al-ismi wa al-udwan. That help each other in bir and in taqwa, in goodness and in piety, and not in sin and in aggression. And you asked a question earlier, Dr. Aslam, that why or how did we forget this duty of social justice and standing up? And perhaps we did not pay heed to the Quran that, you know, help each other in bir and in taqwa. And when you look at the oppression, and, you know, zulm, uh, sometimes these words are interchangeably used. But, you know, the, the actual word of zulm, and you're a, you're a better scholar of Arabic than I am, 
that the, the word zulm really is displacement, to put something where it does not belong. And truly, I mean, that is the basic understanding of oppression as it were, that this, it does not belong. These people do not belong to be treated in, in this way and that we have taken away the, the rights of these people. In so far as some practical solutions, or in so far as, you know, what should our response be? You know, we go back to, to, to Karbala and explore some lessons from Karbala. And Karbala teaches us, Imam Hussain and his companions taught us, that no matter what the odds are, 72 or 100, whatever that number was against thousands, that one needs to be courageous in the face of hardship and in the face of tyranny. And the, the society sometimes takes the easy way or moves away from engaging itself, saying, this is not my problem. This is happening out in Burma. This is happening out in India. What can I do sitting here? So really, it's to be courageous in the face of hardships. Daring to speak the truth, speaking truth to power. And it is not easy, it is difficult. But if we girdle our loins and say, yes, we will speak truth to power, then something will happen. Look at the state of the Indian Muslims. Who is speaking truth to power? There are few voices, but where is the rest of the Muslim Ummah? What is happening out there? Why are those voices silent? insofar as other places too. To fight against injustice and oppression has, is a strategy. It is not something that is ad hoc. We did not get here, you know, just overnight. This thing has, these things have been happening. It is our lack of strategy to actually deal with this as the Ummah because we get distracted with minor points of disagreement and waste all our energy in minor points of disagreement, rather than looking at the bigger picture and seeing that here is an oppressed mass and this is what we need to do. And lastly, I have always called for an empathy revolution. If one were to inculcate the, the power of empathy in oneself, one person at a time to see how the other party feels what is their situation, putting yourself in their, in their place to actually promote empathy, compassion, understanding is something that we can all do in our own ways. And of course, there is also always the economic, the financial, the element where people need to be supported. We need to care for those in need, those of us who are endowed with more than what we need there is a place for us to have a concerted effort to assist and to aid those people who are under the yoke of this oppression. And that is one way of looking at Karbala to say that if we can be inspired by Karbala to contribute to society, to give our, our life passion and fulfillment, to try and do something which is larger than ourselves, to work for social transformation, then we, we nurture a generation that considers these as cardinal principles, then change slowly starts taking place. And these tyrants, yes, the tyrants will go one day, but on the day of judgment, we will be asked that when these tyrants were ruling, what did you do about it? And that is a call of time. And that is the message of this Muharram and every Muharram that is to come. Dr. Azam, you still mute. Sorry. Um, I think one of the things that we have to realize is that we have to change and shift the paradigm of overthinking. This events at Karbala. 
and a great sacrifice and a martyrdom should be seen as part of Islam, not as part only of Shia Islam. <coughs> because unless we basically have that kinds of understanding and sensitivity, we would not be doing justice to the Quran and we would not be doing justice to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's one thing. The second thing that we have to realize, even though we are not in a position uh, to basically pass judgment to the people of the past, that certain mistakes were made and grave mistakes were made. And without basically acknowledging those mistakes and the implications of those mistakes throughout history. We cannot undo the wrongs that have taken place in history. The third thing is that the leadership of the both the communities must find ways to have that empathy with each other that you mentioned. So that at the initial stages, we avoid talking in a language that is offensive to any one of us. And then slowly and gradually move forward. But that does not mean that we should not speak the truth. That does not mean that we should not call a spade a spade. So there has to be some change in paradigm because if we do not do that kind of thing, then Islam would primarily remain a 7th century phenomena without any impact in our world today. Islam's call was not only to regularize the prayers or the rituals. It was its call was to liberate human beings from all yoke of bondage and from the oppression that humans have imposed upon others. And one of the great examples of Karbala is that even if you have to stand against your own self, then do not shy away from that kind of thing. And I think this is where basically we need to focus on uh, that our responsibility is not only confined to 1.8 or 9 billion people, our responsibility is towards all those 7 billion people, majority of whom have been living in suffering and oppression, and many of them have suffered as a result of Muslims' own actions and Muslims' own uh, uh, what you call deviation from the path of the Quran. And with that acknowledgement, I think we have to move forward. That's why you would see that tomorrow when we are talking about uh, Dalits who are the marginalized people within the Hindu community, anyone can ask that how come you are talking about those um, members of the Hindu community. We must realize that as human beings, they have faced this kind of oppression for centuries and the world has been silent about those kind of things. And we would definitely have one of the person who has been doing research on that kind of thing. I will hand it over to Dr. Walji, we have another six or seven minutes to basically uh, conclude whatever we want to conclude. Please uh, uh, go ahead and uh, inshallah then we would have after uh, the, the, the your presentation, the dua, and then conclude tonight's session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashton. Um, indeed, um, great discussion, great points that, uh, that you raised. Uh, and the leadership of both the community, the Sunni and the Shia community, uh, needs to come closer and, and build those bonds more than ever before in order to stand up to this. Uh, just some closing words uh, in terms of what is it that we can do? You know, we have a choice. As human beings, we have an astonishing power of choice. And on the Day of Judgment, we will be asked about the choices that we made. Imam Hussein made his choice in Karbala. Yazid made his choice in Karbala. The power of choice is we can, we have the power to build or the power to destroy. We have the power to listen or the power to ignore, the choice to ignore. 
We have the choice to encourage or the choice to discourage. We have the choice to reach out or turn away. We have the choice to act or to stand still. And it's these choices that will decide who we are as individuals and what our society is each and every day that we make that choice to build rather than destroy, to listen rather than ignore, to encourage rather than discourage, and to act rather than stand still. And really, if there is that critical mass, then it is like those drops in the ocean that actually form the waves that the oppression can be pushed away through those waves of individual choices that we make. Imam Hussein made a choice very clearly. Normally it is said that he refused to give allegiance to Yazid. He refused to give bayat to Yazid. Well, his actual words were mithli, la yubayu mithlahu. That someone like me, the likes of me, who is indeed utterly submissive to Allah, cannot give his hand to somebody like him, meaning Yazid, who is an open sinner. So truly, this is the meaning of Karbala to say that it's not one person against another. It is a choice, and that choice that we make between supporting evil or supporting them. And in therein lies a solution to be able to do something. The least we can do on the day of judgment is, Ya Allah, in my own way, in my own little way, I try. And that's what Allah expects us to do, to make the right choice. With that said, I'll hand this back to Dr. Ashton yes. for a couple of closing remarks. I mean, you are absolutely right. I mean, it's a matter of choice. And unfortunately, during the last 1400 years, the choice that the community has made on these issues has not been very wise, unfortunately. If we had combined our resources, and if we had understood the message of uh, the Quran, the message of the life of the Prophet, the message of Karbala, we would have been partners in fighting against injustice all over the world. We would have been and the one uh, who would be in the forefront of uh, challenging all those things that have ca caused humanity to suffer at great uh, 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 expense in different parts of the world. And certainly the choices that many of us made were not the right choices. We need to acknowledge that. And with that acknowledgement comes the second stage is that what should we do? And in that respect, we would definitely explore that issue throughout the last, the next 10, nine days to see in what manner we can move forward. One of the important things that we have to realize that of all the countries of the world, this country of the United States of America offers perhaps the best opportunity to understand each other, to overcome the differences to go beyond the idioms that we have been using for the last several centuries and to at least bring a closure to many of the things that hurt each other and to basically come together to stand shoulder with shoulder in defense of those who are marginalized, in defense of those who are powerless, in defense of those who are victims of violence, in defense of those who are living under cultural imperialism and in defense of those who feel exploited, no matter whether it is religious exploitation or whether it is economic or political or cultural exploitation. And that is the task that, that we have to undertake. Someone has to undertake if we really uh, have any affinity and any uh, relationship with the message of Karbala and with the great sacrifice. Otherwise, it will mainly and merely remain an academic discussion 
without bringing any meaningful change in the life of the people. With that, we come to a, a conclusion of uh, tonight's uh, presentation. We talked about oppression, we talked about the responsibilities of the Muslim community, and we talked about the joint ventures on the part of Shias and Sunni to challenge the oppression. Tomorrow, we would focus on Dalits. Not many of you might know about it. Many of you do not even know about the Muslim community's struggles in the world. But these are the people who, for the last 5,000 years, have been suffering in a structured way where scriptures basically assign them to a status which is inferior than the rest of the humanity. They are not considered full human beings. They are considered untouchables. And as a creation of God, as a, regardless, even if we happen to belong to any faith, it was our responsibility and it is our responsibility to stand for full dignity and full restoration, respect of all those people. And that discussion will be led by Dr. Mike Goss, who is the chairman of the Center for Pluralism, uh, working in Washington. He comes from India and he has been studying Dalits and the tribals in India for several decades and more better introduction will be given uh, tomorrow, inshallah, when we assemble again at 8.15. With that, uh, we conclude it and I, I would ask Dr. Balji to make the dua and um, we will, inshallah, close this session. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ya Allah, we pray to you to give us a tawfiq to be able to stand for those who are oppressed. Ya Allah, give us the strength to speak the truth. Ya Allah, give us the wisdom to be able to unite our two communities. Ya Allah, give us the patience and the passion to serve our fellow beings. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. Ya Muqallib al-Qulub. Thabit kalbi ala deenik. Mirahmatika, Ya Rahman.